Orida. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the second day of the Wales Biodiversity Partnership Conference. Croeso i Aldiwrnod Cynhadledd Partneriaeth Biamrywiaeth Cymru. Fe enw i di Manon Lewis a dwi'n gweithio fel rheolwr biamrywiaeth a gwydnwch ecosystema i Cyfaith Naturol Cymru, ac ni fyddai yn cadeirio cwn hwylusor sesiwn bora me. Um, my name is Manon Lewis and I'm the Biodiversity and Ecosystem Biodiversity Manager for Natural Resources Wales and I'll be chairing the session this morning. So our first presenter uh, I'd like to welcome is Gareth Edge from the, the Wales Rivers Trust and this morning Gareth is going to give us um, about roughly about a 20 minutes presentation on the Smart Rivers project. So we'll have a presentation from Gareth um, and then we'll go straight on to our, our next um, presentation from Sue Burton from the uh, Pembrokeshire Marine SAC. And then we'll have a short question and answer session afterwards. Gareth, over to you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Gareth. I work for South East Wales Rivers Trust. And this morning we're going to be talking about our Smart Rivers project on the, rivers, on the River Cunnan. Um, before I start any session, um, I always like to show um, what I call an effective starter. So I'm just going to show a short video and talk over that short video um, just as an effective starter to our session. Thanks, Adam. Uh, this is a, a young otter fishing on the River Cun and the river we're going to be talking about today. Filmed in the last couple of weeks by local angler Richard George, who hopefully is going to be one of our smart rivers monitors for the area and it's just a lovely um, mobile phone capture of an otter fishing doing exactly the same as Richard's doing from the bank side um, fishing on the River Cannon like we said. Thanks Adam. So what are we going to be talking about today? We're going to be talking about our Smart Rivers project and the slide that's on the screen now. Um, if you click on it with your mouse, the Smart Rivers um, screen, it should take you and open the Smart Rivers website to be able to see what I'm seeing as I'm talking to you, hopefully. So this is the Smart Rivers website, the project that we're going to be talking about today. It's run by the Salmon and Trout Conservation Trust. Um, and what is Smart Rivers? Um, through Smart Rivers, the Salmon and Trout Conservation Trust are using aquatic invertebrates as a diagnostic test to understand the more subtle and significant water quality pressures stressing juvenile fish. The video at the top of the screen um, shows the kick sample process where the riverbed is being disturbed and all of the river fly invertebrates are being caught in a net um, to be able to be identified um, at a later date. Um, it's part of the Riverfly Plus Citizen Science family, which enables volunteers supported by an Institute of Fisheries Management certified training scheme, training videos, a new invertebrate app, um, invertebrate identification app for citizen scientists, volunteers to monitor the water quality to a near professional standard. It just goes on to say that nature's nursery is under stress. Salmon and trout are extremely vulnerable in the early stages of their life to pollution in the water quality. Um, and the invertebrates are here to help. They're easier and cheaper to sample than the fish themselves. And they can also reveal some um, water quality issues that spot sampling done by regulators um, can't always pick up. And the really key thing to remember about this process and this new project it is the only volunteer river fly monitoring scheme which goes to species level. So we're trying to identify them to the species level and um, to the individual species to understand what water quality pressures are affecting those individual species. That's really key to remember. And um, what's the process? So it's a sample, a three minute pick sweep sample and a one, meet, one minute hand search. It's done biannually, so twice a year in the autumn and in the spring, um, and you get an expert to come out initially to do your what we would call your benchmarking in the autumn and the spring before you start. So you've got a data benchmark for all of your future volunteer kick sampling to be uh, checked against, if you like. 
Um, you learn to analyze the sample, analyze the, the sample that you're taking, and that can be done in one of two methods. So it can either, you can either learn to identify at the species level yourselves using instructional videos and the app that they've created, or you can sample and preserve in alcohol and send away to an expert to be identified. And then there's a database, a national database, where all of the data is stored so you can compare and contrast to other rivers and looking at the water quality of your other local rivers eventually. And that gives you an opportunity then to act both locally or nationally, um, restoration, um, guidance, evaluation, and shape national policy. What training is required? This is a stage that we are currently at, benchmarking. So we've had an expert come to the River Cannon. Um, we've chosen five sites. And that, that then you're, on, you're on, off the back of that benchmarking. You train your volunteers and your citizen scientists. Um, so that's in the, the first day of training is learning to take the three minute kick, kick sample and preserve it in alcohol to be identified. And the second day of the training is to be able to identify those to species level using the app. And then the pathway, like we said, is either that you, you learn to sample and identify yourselves or you sample and you send it away to an expert. The bit at the bottom of the, the web, web page shows the current hubs. If you have a look where they're the Cunnan, and there's lots of resources to, um, lots of videos, instructional videos on the processes and the methods used, some frequently asked questions and the access to the database where all the information is held. If everyone comes back to the slides. So where are we talking about? We're talking about the River Cunnan. River Cannon starts at Sligad Cannon, Pontpren, the village of Pontpren, just south of the village of Penderyn, just inside the Bracken Beacons National Park. Lots of Welsh speakers in the room today, I'm sure, but for those who don't know, Sligad Cannon is the eye of the Cannon. Um, lovely, lovely literal translation, I think, Sligad Cannon, the eye of the Cannon. So that's where the river starts. And that water has been dye traced to a cave on top of the mountain between Pontpren and Merthyr Tydfil. Why are we talking about the River Cannon? Why have we chosen the River Cannon for our Smart Rivers project? Um, does anyone want to have a guess at what sort of era the photograph's from? Um, it's on the screen. Put it in the chat. Feel free to put it in the chat. Um, to me, it looks quite Dickensian. It looks quite Victorian, the amount of pollution coming out of this site. Um, some people will know this is, was active in our lifetime, which I find unbelievable. So we've chosen the river cannon, because I would argue that this faced industrial pressures in far more recent history. So this is the Furnace site site near Abercumboy that was active between the 40s and the 90s. So I just find it quite unbelievable that it was active um, within our lifetime, right on the banks of the river cannon. Um, so like we said, that it's, it's, it's faced industrial pressures far, in far more recent history than a lot of the other valleys rivers. We also need to think about the Tower Colliery site, um, open cast mine on one of the tributaries um, of the River Cannon, which, is, which is, was active up until uh, 2008. So that's the sort of reasons why we've chosen the River Cannon for our Smart Rivers project, the industrial pressures that it's faced in far more recent years. So again, where are we talking about? So there's a map on the screen just off up to the top left there. Um, is Pompren, where the Leagad Cannon is, where the river starts, comes down through Herwine, comes down through Trecanon, Aberdeer, Mountain Ash, Penru, Kyber, and the pin at the bottom right hand side of your screen is Aber Cannon, where the River Cannon joins the main river Taff. Lovely, nice, literal um, Welsh translation again for those who don't know. You see Aber on all of the signs in Wales. Aber literally means the pouring of water. So Aberdeer is where the Deer River pours into the Cannon, and Aber Cannon is where the Cannon River pours into the Taff. Aber in Welsh, the pouring of water. Just a lovely literal translation. Um, we've chosen five sites right along the length of the Cannon, from above the source all the way to the confluence for our Smart Rivers kick sampling. Um, and we've chosen five sites along the length because that's in line with the catchment-based approach, where we want to understand the pressures on the invertebrates all the way along the length of this river. So rather than us just focusing on one site and having five sites within that one stretch, this will give us a much better opportunity of having a better understanding of the water quality along the whole length of the river. Um, so above the 
above the source, above Ligad Canon in Pont Pren, um, is our first site. Uh, Penna Wine near the primary school, near some stepping stones, is our second site. Um, near Abadir as does Tier Founder, little new housing estate, is our third site. Our fourth site is Mountain Nash Peace Park, just by Mountain Ash Hospital, um, just south of the Wildlife Trust Polwine Cannon Reserve. And our final site is Abba Cannon, just near the confluence with the main TAF. And again, like I said, that th those five sites have been chosen to be monitored by volunteer citizen scientists to give us a a picture of the, the water quality along and the invertebrate life along the whole length of the River Cannon, hopefully. Why are we doing it? Why are we interested in river fly invertebrates? A simple graph illustrating the pressures upon the river fly invertebrates, the groups that we are really interested in. If you have a look at this simple graph, massive insect decline globally in the past decade, and out at the top of our list comes the caddis flies, one of the groups we're most interested in. 68% decline globally in the past decade. Come down the list, mayflies, one of the other groups that we're interested in. 37% decline in the past decade. And the third group that we're really interested in, stoneflies, 35% decrease in the past decade. I was on one of these Zoom talks with Dr. Steve Omerod, who I'm sure a lot of you will know in the past few weeks, and he had a slide stating that there's been an 84% collapse in freshwater species populations since the 70s, which is more than terrestrial and more than marine. Um, we, we just don't hear anywhere near um, as much in the press about the decline in freshwater populations. So who are we talking about? Another lovely quote that I heard recently um, was from Peter Limbu, who's a freshwater manager from one of the largest lakes in the world in Tanzania, and he just gave a quote. Um, We're all born conservationists, and it just really rang home with me, and I thought it was really lovely um, in terms of uh, citizen scientists that it's never too late um, to, to get back involved with uh, conservation and protecting and nurturing um, the natural world. Um, so that, that really brings home citizen science for me. Um, so this is Cannon Valley Organic Adventures. Uh, one of our volunteer trainees all kitted up, ready to do his um, kick sample training. And, and I'm hopeful that these are going to be, again, our Smart Rivers monitors for the project once it starts. This is them in the river. So this is about, like we're saying, them taking stewardship, them taking guardianship of their own local patch of river. And it's that eyes and ears on the ground when we're talking about river conservation. You know, these are the best people. They're going to be there. Um, they, they, this is called Cannon Valley Organic Adventures, and it's a community garden space where the river runs straight past their community garden. Um, so they're the best place, really, to monitor that stretch of river, and they're going to be able to see any, any changes any changes um, in the invertebrate life or pollution source, point source pollution, um, even things like littering and invasive species. This is them set up to analyze their sample. Um, so they got uh, magnification tools and they got separate in, tray, in trays and they got their ID guides to be able to learn to recognize at a family level at this stage. This is another one of their key volunteers. And he's separated his sample out now um, to be able to take an estimate count of the species that he's found and the different families that he's going to identify from the ID guides. Um, it's really important in terms of biodiversity and biosecurity that all of the kit is um, dried in sunlight afterwards um, to stop the spread of invasive species. Um, so what are we looking at? What sort of things are we um, identifying? This is a flat-bodied stone clinging mayfly larval nymph, uh, body in three sections, a head, a thorax, and an abdomen, and six legs identifies it as an insect. Three tails identifies, identifies it as a mayfly nymph, as opposed to the other groups that we're looking at. Why are we interested in them? Um, this is from the same size. From the same sample, this is a bullhead or a miller's thumb, and um, so the invertebrate is an excellent food source for fish. For fish, as we started out at the top of the 
presentation. This is a cased caddis fly larval nymph, and it's got this amazing um, suit of armor, if you like, this amazing protective case that it may, makes by spinning silk like a spider or a caterpillar and adhering all of the grit in the bed of the river together to protect it from being eaten by fish, but also to protect it from being eaten by um, our only aquatic songbird, um, the dipper. This is a photograph taken on Rada Weir by Kenrick Clement Evans, 26th of October this year. Um, so by protecting and conserving these invertebrates will also help in our native river birds. The first picture that we saw, the mayfly stone clinging larval nymph, this is the sort of thing it'll hatch out into. This is a sub imago. So mayflies are the only insect species in the world that have two adult stages. So they'll hatch up into what we call a sub imago. No mouth parts, they don't eat. Um, their only purpose is to breed. They'll then hatch out again um, for a matter of hours, and their only purpose is, is to breed. And that's when you see those um, big hatches on the river. And ephemera or ephemeral, that's, that's where the um, short lived, that's where the word ephemera comes from, um, the Latin name of mayflies. Um, stonefly is the, one of the other groups, like we said, that we're really interested in. If you look at the previous picture, mayflies are upwing flies, their, their wings close vertically um, over their back. Stoneflies, their wings close parallel along their body. So these are the adults now that we're looking at of the invertebrates that we're sampling in the river. This is a caddis fly, a typical adult, adult caddis fly. So the one that we saw, the, the nymph in the, in the protective case, this is the sort of thing that it's going to hatch out into. Um, and like we said, all of these flies um, are not only an excellent and abundant food source for our river birds, such as our dippers and our grey wagtails, but they're also in a really abundant food source for terrestrial migrants, such as the swift, the swallow and the martin. Um, so if there's a big shift in um, abundance of these river fly invertebrates, it's also going to have a catastrophic effect on our terrestrial migratory species. If you go to any of our rivers um, in this peak summertime, you'll see huge um, flocks of swallows, swifts, and martins taking advantage of the abundance of um, food that's coming out of our, hatching out of our rivers, if you like. So we come full circle, if you like, to migratory Atlantic salmon coming back up the river tap. This was taken on Rada Weir just a couple of weeks ago in October by Frank Seng Peel. And it's important to remember that these adult fish, when they're migrating, back up the, 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 our rivers, um, they don't tend to eat, that, you know, again, that, that their only thought process is to get back up to their spawning ground to breed, which is what makes them um, such a challenge for anglers to catch, because they don't really tend to, to feed. But if we've come full circle now, and we think back to the whole reason why we're doing it, we're protecting the, the nursery for these Atlantic salmon, so for their fry, for their par, um, the, 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 we want to know about the water quality and we want to know about the levels of invertebrate. Is it going to be suitable nursery for the juvenile salmon? I'm going to finish with a quote. Um, took my daughter at the Folly Farm in Pembrokeshire between the lockdowns this year. They got a lovely quote so all over the, the site, um, but this one rang true with me and um, just sums up really what we're trying to talk about today. Um, without habitat, there is no wildlife. It's that simple, and that just that that really tells us that if we don't have the water quality and the right habitat for the invertebrates, then we're not going to have the the fish and the birds. And if we don't have the fish, if we think right back to the beginning, we don't have the the water quality for the fish and the invertebrates, and we're not going to get the big enigmatic species that we'd all like to see more of, like the author that we saw at the top of the presentation. Thanks for listening. Um, Dich Vriam Gareth.